It's time now for 15 Minutes of Faith, practical application of God's timeless truth for today. A ministry of Harvest Baptist Church in Bay City, Michigan, where we glorify God, live His purpose, and love people well. So let's get growing with 15 Minutes of Faith. Hello and welcome to 15 Minutes of Faith. I am your host, Pastor Jeremy Byler of Harvest Baptist Church in Bay City, Michigan. And we're going to do something a little bit different today here on 15 Minutes of Faith is we're going to pick up on a sermon I preached from Ecclesiastes chapter number three. And we're at the latter parts of the chapter, verses 16 through 22, where Solomon has come to the realization that there are only so many certainties in life. After searching the entire earth for its riches and for its provision, it is all vanity and vexation, with the exception of being born, dying, and of course, the coming judgment. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I would just ask that you listen intently and see where you're at in this portion in your life, whether you are born again and just really need to surrender to God's will for your life, or if you're not born again and you need to call upon Jesus Christ for salvation. Nonetheless, wherever you're at, just seek the Lord and let's listen in. The way that I think it should be taken care of. And that's what Solomon's alluding to here. He says, I saw under the sun the place judgment that wickedness was there and the place of righteousness and that iniquity was there. He's looking to the wrong place. And finally, he comes to the realization in verse 17. He says, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. Why in verse 17? For there is a time there for every purpose and every work. So the idea is if somebody says to you, you know, why doesn't God stop all the killing, all the evil, all the wickedness in the world? The answer is he will in his time. You know, it just reminds me of when my kids were were little and uh, they started to figure out where we were going and what we were doing. They especially knew the route to church. And they would sit in the van, and then uh, sometimes maybe, you know, Michigan, there'd be construction one way, and I'd have to go out and leave the house and take a different way. And, and it, was, it never failed. Kids would always be like, what are you doing? Where are you going? Uh, what's going on? What, what's happening? And it'd be like, calm down. We just have to take a different way. I understood. I could see what was down the road. My time and my purpose was still to get us to church or wherever it was that we were going. The same is true with God. But so many times we think, God, what are you doing? Where are we going? What's happening? What's going on? And God says, hold on. I've got it under control. And God's going to come. And the idea here is, is that God shall judge the righteous. We will all stand in some form of judgment. Whether it's the uh, saved individual standing before and given account as to how we lived for Christ during the time that we could live for Christ in salvation and sanctification here on earth. Worse yet, there will be those whose name was not found in the Lamb's book of life that will face the eternal condemnation and stand in that judgment as they are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And this is a certainty. And that's what we see here in verse 17. He says again, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and every work. It's nothing we can deny. It's nothing we can skirt around. It's nothing we can explain away. And the idea here is not that we are to tremble in fear, perhaps in regards to the coming judgment of God in regards to that, but the idea is that there is a way out. (laughs) There's a way to avoid it. Uh, God is saying, I am coming. Judgment will be there. You will stand before me one day. But how do you want to stand? Do you want to stand in yourself with your own righteousnesses that are as filthy rags? Try to explain to me how that your works are perfect works when they are not, because they are stained with the stain of sin. You see, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. There's a difference. There's a difference there, uh, because we are born with that inherent nature of sin within us. Because of the sin of Adam, the trait of sin is passed on to all men. And for all have sinned. Because a lot of times we think that, well, well, okay, I know that I've sinned, but... And we try to explain these things away. But there is no explanation when it comes to standing before a righteous God. 
the only way out is through Jesus Christ. And we see that the judgment shall come. So do you want to stand in your own self, standing and representing yourself? What do they say in court? He that represents himself has a fool for a client, right? And the idea here is, uh, and the, the biblical word fool is the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. But even more so in the court of holiness in the high heaven before a holy God, we have the advocate in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to stand in the gap, to stand in between, uh, so long as we put our trust in him. And to say, Heavenly Father, you know, uh, uh, Jesus died for my sin. I have called upon him for salvation. And we really don't even need to speak. Jesus says, Father, forgiven. And we are cleansed and we are clean. And the judgment is coming. The certainty is coming. In verse 18, he says, he says, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and they might see that they themselves are beasts. What he's talking about here, and he, he kind of uh, uh, reiterates that in verse 19 where he says, for that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath. So that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. Obviously, our mortal bodies, our mortal bodies, this physical being, this physical flesh that we have, will eventually, uh, will eventually uh, suffer the same fate as even the beasts of the earth, that this flesh will die. This flesh will fail, will give out, and we will return, the, the flesh will return to the ground. But the difference between us and the animals is we have a soul created in the image of God, that has an eternal destination. And that is the difference. And if we just focus on this earth and the vanity of living for this world, living for the things of the earth, that the end is still the same no matter what. Coming from Solomon, the richest man that ever was and probably that ever will be. And again, he struggled with it in chapter number two about, you know what, some other man's going to get the fruits of my labor. I cannot take it with me. As I return to the ground, so too will every other man. And not only that, as we return to the ground as the beasts and we will die, that is our fate. But yet the judgment is coming and our souls have an eternal destination. Verse 20, he says, all go into one place, all are of the dust, and turn to dust again. But in verse 21, he says, who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward in the earth? Wherefore, I perceive that there is nothing better than a man should rejoice in his own works, for that he is, uh, that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? So it kind of comes full circle here as we see the certain certainties is we see God's judgment is coming. We are all fallen. We all face uh, the same mortal fate. But yet we don't have to just be re reduced to that. There's even a greater, a greater sentence coming to each and every one of us. For those of us that wish to stand in our own estate, we are looking at an eternity in a place called hell, a literal hell. See, the world tries to explain that away. Even in the Western culture, the Western part of the world, they try to explain away the devil that he doesn't exist. Demons aren't real. The devil's just a funny little character with a pitchfork and pointy ears and runs around and just kind of calls all the, you know, he stands on your shoulders and tries to get you to be naughty. No, 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 no. The Bible says the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is our adversary. He's contrary to everything we're trying to do. And he is real. He is real. And he hates us. And, he, and the, biggest, the biggest trick that he's ever done was convincing us that he does not exist so that we are blind to our sin. And hell is a real place created for the, for the devil who uh, in, in times past thought he would make himself as the most high God. He thought he would sit on the throne where God belongs and, and he was cast out of heaven. And hell was created for Lucifer. Lucifer was the angel of music at one time, but now is the great deceiver, is the, the father of lies. He and his, and, and his ilk and the demons that followed him will be cast into the lake of fire, but so too whose name was not found in the Lamb's book of life. There's a parable in the New Testament talking about the rich man and Lazarus. Whereas uh, Lazarus died and was caught up into Abraham's bosom. That's a picture in the old Hebrew, the Jewish times of, of being in heaven. But the idea of the rich man was found in a place of torment. He was in literal hell. He was there. That is a real place 
where those uh, who are not found righteous in God's sight will spend an eternity because of the sin nature that dwells within each and every one of us. And even those that are in hell are, are, are crying out on behalf of us on earth. If you ever think about that, we have the people on earth, Christians should be praying for the unsaved and alike. Uh, we should be saying, you know, this individual is unsaved and, and we need to be praying for them. And, and uh, you know, we, we know that they're destined for this. And, but you know what? Even those in hell that uh, are totally separated from God, crying out as Lazarus did, uh, or the rich man did, saying, can you please just dip your finger in water and touch my tongue? And he says, no. He says, fine, then send somebody so that they will believe. And he says, it is sufficient that they had the law and the prophets. Even if one rise from the dead, they still would not believe. But here's the thing, is so many people will say, you know, there's so much unfairness in the world. Uh, there's so much injustice in the world. And that why would God, even in his greatest injustice, why would he create us on this earth and then condemn us all to hell? But it wasn't God who condemned us. It was our sin that condemned us. As Jesus said, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but the world was condemned already. And that's the other side of the coin, is that God knows his judgment is coming in his time in his season, for his purpose. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to, to live the sinless, perfect life on this earth, out of the ivory palaces, into a place of woe, to walk amongst those created in his image. And they would not believe him. They turned away. They spat on him. They mocked him. They scorned him uh, and put a crown of thorns on his head and nailed him to a cross. Considered a blasphemer, but yet he was God in the flesh. Yet nonetheless, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he, he was obedient unto, unto death, even the death of the cross. And as he was nailed to that cross, the sin that has been committed past, present, and future, my sin that I committed past, present, and future was nailed to the cross of Calvary as Jesus paid the price for our sins. Paid the price for my sin. But here's the deal, is that he didn't stay on the cross. He was buried. And as we know, you don't bury a living person. You bury the dead. That's how we know Jesus died. His death was sufficient to pay the price for the sin of the world. And he was buried in a tomb of, uh, purchased by Joseph of Arimathea. And on the third day, he rose again. The stone was rolled away. He rose again and walked on the earth for some time until he went up into the heavens and the comforter was set. His resurrection is important. The death, burial, and resurrection, according to the scriptures, was of the utmost importance because his death was paying for the penalty of sin, but his resurrection was conquering, conquering the power of sin once and for all, that we are no longer under the power of sin so long as we surrender over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you do? What do you do in that situation? Do we, do we just look to the cross and say, well, thank you, Jesus. I'm glad you took one for the team. No, that's not what it is. There must be a transaction that takes place. There actually it may not even a transaction. There must be yet another death that takes place, and that is the dying of self unto, unto Christ as we surrender our lives over unto him, calling upon him for salvation, asking him to save us from our sin nature and having us be born again into a new nature. Born again in the spirit, as the Bible says, as we call upon Christ, as we too were nailed to that cross, paying the price for our sin. We get forgiveness of sin, we die to the old self, and we become a new creature and we call upon Christ for salvation. And we allow him to come into our hearts, and we allow him to be the Lord of our life, and we allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us and to comfort us, and we then have the joy and the peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't say our trials will go away. In fact, for some, the trials increase, but yet so too does the joy because you're no longer going through these things alone. You have Jesus walking alongside with you, helping you, guiding you, comforting you, giving you wisdom, giving you direction, coming through in miraculous ways that you could never even imagine in your life because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he is our great provider, our great physician, our great healer, and all the things that we could ever imagine so long as we trust in him. So not only does salvation give us an eternity in heaven when we die, but it gives us a life in God's time, his season, 
and his purpose while we're here on earth.